can everyone hear us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the kind and warming um, welcomes. And my name is Jason Park, and I'm a PhD student in Seoul National University. So the talk is going to about our recent paper, paper called The Exact Optimal Accelerated Complexity for Fixed Blade Durations. And as um, introduced earlier, it will be um, analyzing the, comp the iteration complexity of the fixed blade durations in terms of um, acceleration. So let's move on to see what the fixed blade duration is in a very um, brief manner. So the fixed point iteration is defined as the following. For an operator T, which gets an um, n-dimensional vector as an input and outputs also the n-dimensional vector, if we start from the initial letter at x0 and just repeatedly apply the operator T, it is called a fixed point iteration. So far, the T does not, uh, T is only the operator that maps a vector to a vector. But if it is, uh, it has some kind of conditions. So if it is under suitable assumptions, the iterates xk will converge to the x star, which is the fixed point of t. So whenever the whenever we get um, the problem at hand and we formulate into the um, problem of finding a fixed point, fixed point iteration will help us to find the solution to the problem. And one of the very simple example would be the gradient descent. So gradient descent is when given a function f. And when our objective is to find the minimum or the stationary point of the function f, then we can apply the gradient descent as the following. So the gradient descent, starting from the initial iterate, it updates the next, it chooses the next iterate to be um, uh, to be the xk minus the eta times the greta of the x that is evaluated at xk. And with the eta is be being positive, this is also the fixed point iteration with the operator t being the identity minus the eta times the gradient of f. And also under the suitable assumption, or um, um, if we choose eta to be uh, eta wisely, xk also converts to the fixed point, and um, surprisingly, it would be the stationary point in this case. And um, there are a lot of like. A lot of other algorithms that is that can be categorized into the fixed point iteration, and these are some examples. So the gradient descent that I have introduced at the first would be would, is also the fixed point iteration. There's something called the proximal gradient method, and prox operator here is just you can think of as the argument to the function plus some regularization term. And there's also the algorithm called the ADMM, which minimizes the sum of the two functions. And this is widely used in the numerical solvers that is used in, the, in solving the industrial problems. And there's also value iteration, which is also the fixed point iteration. So all these schemes are repeatedly applying the same operator for many, many times and reach the fixed point or the solution to the problem we want to solve. So um, I only presented four examples, but there are many other things that can be um, considered as a fixed point iteration. And this, that is, uh, this is the reason why I wanted to um, analyze the fixed point iteration as the meta algorithm that, um, that covers all these sorts of algorithms. And I'm going to talk about what um, uh, fixed point iteration and give a theoretical analysis on the manner of iteration complexity or the rate of convergence, and also how it can be accelerated with other types of fixed point iterations. So uh, the presentation will be uh, presented in following orders. I will start with the prior work that is closely related to the convergent re analysis in the convex optimization literature. And after that, in order, I will um, briefly talk about which uh, problem setups we are considering and present the results, which is the optimal fixed point iteration we have discovered and how we proven how we certified the optimality of those fixed point iteration. After that, I'm going to show you the very, very simple experiments and reach the conclusions. So um, I'm going to present um, a line of research regarding the convergence rate analysis. So the problem at, ha at hand or the problem we want to solve is called the com smooth convex minimization problem. So this is the problem that um, we are looking for the, minimi uh, the minimum of the given function f, which is smooth and convex. So this function is under the condition that it has the L Lipschitz gradient or L Lipschitz gradient or F being the L smooth function. And it has to be convex function as well. And a very simple approach would be using the gradient descent 
and with the step size eta k being one over l. And this will result, result in having this, kind, this type of inequality where in the left-hand side, there is a difference between the function value and the actual minimum. And on the, on the right-hand side, there is a term which is, which tells, um, which is found um, of the order of what over n. Which, uh, so as the large n gets bigger, it will, go, it will diminish and go to zero. So we have a guarantee that gradient descent will make the function value converge to the actual minimum. But um, this is down an analysis focused on the function value. We can do the same thing for the other types of uh, quantities, such as the square norm of the gradient. Then if the, uh, if the function value at the very first initial iterate is bounded, we can prove that the gradient descent with the same step size will result in having this type of um, um, the bound, the upper bound to the uh, norm of the gradient. And um, for the first uh, for the first inequality, this is how we can measure the performance of the algorithm in terms of function value. And the second inequality is how we can measure the performance of the algorithm in terms of the uh, gradient, the gradient uh, norm of the gradient. So um, this is often called the optimality measure because it is um, measuring how optimal this uh, per the performance of the algorithm can get. And on the right hand side, these are the called the initial conditions because if these are not, um, these are not the bounded quantities, this inequality will never like, this will be the vacuous, just vacuously true um, inequalities. So given that the, given this, these initial, in, initial conditions being bounded, as this, as this inequality gets valid, we can show that the function value converges to actual minimum by the order of one over n, and also the minimum of the norm the gradient by the order of one over n. So um, a lot of people wonder whether this type of convergence rate can be much faster. And it means that, can we make this quantity here to be more, more um, smaller in terms of large n? And actually this was made possible in uh, night, the seminal work Nestrop in 1980, uh, 1983. So this method is called the accelerated gradient method, short as short AGM, or for some of you, this term will be much familiar, the NAC. So at first you take the gradient this decent step, and then as some additional sub term called the momentum term to result in the conversions. And this results in having the conversion rate of one over n squared. So this is much better because we have improved from one over n rate to the, the rate of order one over n squared. So this has been a huge improvement, but people, a lot of people wonder whether we can go further. Can this be more faster? And this is actually true because in 2016, the, in the work of Kim and Fessler, they come up with the optimized gradient method a short for OGM, which added some additional correction term here and resulted in having the, it, it is the same order, but it has the factor two shapes just shaven off. So we had two, the constant factor two here, but for the OGM, the conversion rate has um, no other constant factor than one. So this is faster in, uh, in theory. So can we do it better? Can we do more on improving the rate? Well, actually this is impossible and we can show it mathematically. So um, the complexity lower bound is, as the term suggests, it is a lower bound to the iteration complexity or the convergence rate. So in 2017, Yuval Jory came up with the, this theorem and it says that there exists a L smooth convex function, which is very behaving very, very bad so that even if we um, choose an algorithm to set it, algorithm that satisfy this kind of condition, which is very broad. So this condition includes all the uh, previous algorithms such as gradient descent, AGM, NAC, and OGM. But even if we bring, even if we use, um, even if you use any algorithm, then uh, any algorithms, this quantity here, the difference between the function value and actual minimum cannot be smaller than this quantity here. And how can this uh, theorem tells you that the complexity cannot be improved or the rate of conversion can be improved? Well, you can do this by just plugging into two inequalities. So 
as the previous slide suggests, there is a worst case function app, the bad behaving function app that satisfies the, this inequality on the left hand side. But we have, we have shown that the optimized graded method or OGM results in having this kind of rate. So, fun, so if we apply OGM for any choice of smooth convex function, this upper bound holds, therefore taking supremum is not, not weird thing to do. And taking supremum makes this inequality, uh, inequality on the middle hold. Therefore, even if we take any algorithm in the class of the algorithm that satisfies this um, type of condition, we cannot make this upper bound smaller than this quantity here. But we have shown that this quantity is actually equal to the rate of the OGM. Therefore, OGM has the fastest convergence rate. And in the convex optimization literature, people say OGM is an exactly optimal method. And we say the AGM and NAC is an optimal method, but it is optimal only up to a constant vector. Uh, so these are the, how the line of words have been done for smooth convex minimization. And um, in our paper, we, want, we wanted to do the uh, same kind of um, things and reasoning for the fixed point iteration. So in the preliminaries, I'm going to talk about what the setups we are talking, we are considering um, for the fixed point iteration. So this is kind of like fixed point iteration 101 class. So as I mentioned in the very first slide, the fixed point iteration is repeat uh, is an iter uh, iterative scheme that applies the operator t many many times and reaches the convergence to the fixed point. So this is the um, so. Um, what we want, uh, we want to find a fixed point of operator T, therefore we can measure the fixed point residu with residual, which is the difference between the X and TS. When this is equal to zero, it means that we have, uh, we have exactly find the fixed point, but, um, but usually we, are just, we just have the convergence asymptotically, so we would just observe this quantity, see if this is very, very small and, and the iteration when we are using it in a practical sense. And it can also be used as a termination criteria because we this quantity can be calculated even if we do not know what the fixed point is. So this is our optimality measure. And um, we will be, uh, and to add the initial condition would be the distance between the initial point and the fixed point. So um, the fixed point, uh, fixed point iteration converges in under some assumptions, and I'm going to introduce what which assumptions we can think of. So the operator T can be either contractive or non-expansive operator. So contraction is um, is something that if we apply operator T on some some points, then these two points will not go like too far far away from each other. And we say it is. Um, I'm just using the one over gamma term and one over gamma contractive with gamma is bigger than one. So this one over gamma factor is smaller, smaller than one. Therefore, this quantity here makes um, Tx minus Ty to be smaller than X minus Y, but smaller in a sense that linear factor here um, is multiplied to the, the distance between X and Y before applying operator T. And we say T is not expensive if the distance between two points or at most um, preserved after applying T. And if the operator T is one over gamma contracted with gamma being um, bigger than one, therefore this quantity here being less than one, it, starting from XK and going to XK plus one, we get this type, this kind of inequality here. So, X, so according to the definition of the fixed point iteration, XK plus one is actually equal to TXK, X star is the fixed point, so it is also equal to T X star. So we can eliminate T and obtain the right-hand side bound. So this one over gamma here is less than one. So if we just uh, use this inequality from K from zero to like, like large N, this, this right-hand side term here will be one over gamma to the power of K and X zero minus X star. Therefore, this right-hand side will converge to zero as the K goes bigger. Therefore, the fixed point iteration converts to, will converge to the fixed point if the operator T is a contraction. But um, let's say T is a non-expansive operator. This is much general condition because it is not a contraction, but it is um, at most preserving the distance, right? So, but 
Under this condition, the convergence is not guaranteed. We can think of a simple rotation, like 90 degree rotation starting at the 1.0 and they should rotate around, but the radius is not decreasing, so it will never converge to the fixed point. So, um, uh, so I think this is like the boundary, the condition that is on the boundary from separating the fixed point iteration from converging and non-converging. And um, in the fixed point, in the fixed point theory, there has been uh, other types of fixed point iterations that we can think of that is that is satisfying the interme intermediate conditions to contractedness and non-expansiveness. This is called the averageness. So now going back to the average operator. Um, the operator T is theta average with theta being between zero and one. If this is the convex combination between the identity operator, which is the I here, and the operator N, which is some non-expansive operator. So if, it's, if it is some weighted sum of identity operator and non-expansive operator, then we call this a theta, theta average operator or just average. And this is an intermediate concept because contractions are included in, they are also average operator with some, like some N and this is also the non-expensive operators. And surprisingly, the fixed point iteration with average operator will converge to the fixed point. And this is actually a simple, um, a simple example of the, of the fixed point iteration called the Kranosaski mount iteration. So when the T, when T is non-expansive, fixed point iteration is not guaranteed to converge. But if we take lambda K to be, uh, lambda K to be, um, let's say just a constant between zero and one, it will result in having the conversion rate here. I think there's a typo, but um, if lambda is exactly one over two, so if it's just one half, it will have this conversion rate. And you can see in the, formulation of the KM iteration, this is actually applying one over lambda K plus one average operator for just for all the iterations. So we are just applying the average operator iteratively. Um, and you can see that fixed point residual here is um, converging to zero at the order of one over N, but this can be made faster by using something called the Halper iteration. So so if we go back to Kronoseski mount iteration, this is a complex combination between TXK and XK. So we are just using the information on about the previous iterate. But um, Halper iteration actually also uses the information on the initial iterate, which is kind of strange. So this is actually, uh, you can think of it as um, we are choosing the iterate to be uh, somewhat a little bit close to the initial point. So some people call this, some people call this an anchor as well. And if we choose lambda k or lambda k plus one here to be one over k plus two, this will result in one over n squared rate of conversion. So this is a bit faster. The Halper iteration accelerates, uh, it will make the rate of conversion more faster by making it from order one over n to one over n squared. And we will refer to this specific Halper iteration with lambda e lambda chosen as this quantity here as an optimized Halper method. And this was um, this rate was actually um, driven from the works of Leader. And this will uh, our our um, conversion rate analysis will subsume this result as well. So. Um, well, the fixed point iteration that we know are just repeatedly applied operator T multiple times, but did these K iteration and Halper iteration have a form of like, have a form of just um, adding some interpolation schemes with like X zero and X K. So from now on, we are going to say that al this, the algorithm is a fixed point iteration. If it generates a sequence of iterates starting from X zero and that is, which satisfies this assumption here. So XK is chosen when, uh, so when knowing the information, information about X zero and the, um, the fixed point residual uh, evaluated at X zero to XK minus one, we will choose the XK to be in the linear span of these vectors plus X zero. So K iteration here, so K iteration is also in, the same category and Halpern, Halpern is also in the same category as well. So they will be called a fixed point iteration 
<clears throat> in a more general sense. And, uh, and there are some other fixed point iterations such as um, Anderson scheme or other types of stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about those things, but I want you to know that this linear, linear span assumption includes a broad range of fixed point iterations. So um, the, before we go into the main result, the research question I want to um, answer what answer is, answer will, can be summarized into two uh, questions. The first one is to um, uh, see what is the exactly optimal fixed point iteration with respect to this optimally measure and the initial this initial, initial condition. So we want to find what is the optimal fixed point iteration in um, under the, the mentioned conditions on the operators. And the second question is, how can we prove that it is actually exactly optimal? And we wanted to give an answer to that. So this, these are our main results. So first of all, the, we have uh, found the optimal fixed point iteration called, which we call the OC Halpern. And this is a short for optimal contractive Halpern. So when operator T is one over gamma contractive, then and if we choose the step size here, one over pi k to be defined as the following, the Halpern iteration with one over lambda k as the, um, the, the step size will result in the exact optimal conversions. So I'm although I have been using the term contractive for the case for gamma bigger than one, I'm going to include the case where gamma equals one as well for um, denoting the case where T is a non-expansive operator. So when the gamma is equal to one, and if one contractiveness is actually the same as non-expansive in, um, in our paper. So the convergence rate is as follows. So this seems a little bit um, complicated, but if we compare the convergence rate to the fixed point iteration with contraction, we can see there is some, there is some constant gap here. And if the gamma is equal to one, this is actually the optimized half method that I have introduced in the earlier slide about half iteration. And this, will, this um, convergence rate is actually the one that was discovered by the leader by a leader in 2021. So if we, if we take gamma equals one, this is two, two to the power of two. This is also the square term of one over n plus one, therefore we get this result as well. So we are, we are going to um, do, an, do analysis for gamma bigger than equal to one in a whole, in a whole sum. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to state the details of the proof, but, but we are doing, the proof has done using the VFNAP analysis, where we define some potential, something called the potential function, which is the sequence of functions in K, sequence in K. So here A, A tilde is something that I haven't explained in the, in the slide before, but this is just the same thing as these quantities here and these quantities here. And we can show that BK is actually monotonically non-increasing in terms of K and if we get and from the uh, from the result that v large n is less than v zero, we get the desired result where um, the fixed point residual is upper bounded by this term. And um, with the there, I have brought I brought some illustrated example which shows you how the OC Halpern works. So this um, this uh, black line here is just um, it's a simple contraction. And you can see if there's if this is a contraction with a rotating behavior, it will rotate around like, like this having this trajectory, but it is a bit far from being close to the fixed point, actual fixed point, which is the yellow star here. But if, if we pull the error to be a bit close to the anchor or the initial point, at the face like here, it will be a bit close to the fixed point, fixed point than the the plane contraction. And we can also observe the square mode of the fixed point residual, and we can see, we can observe that OC Halpern is actually faster than the plane fixed point iteration, which was labeled as Picard iteration. Okay, um, so the, the rate of the OC Halpern has been 
um, established, and we have also shown that this is actually exactly optimal. So we have constructed a one over gamma contracted operator T, where um, for any sequence of areas satisfying this condition here, which includes KM and Halpern, this quantity, the optimally measure, which is the left-hand side of the inequality, cannot be smaller than the right-hand side. And this right-hand side was actually the exact, exactly same convergence rate to the LC Halpern. Therefore, we can conclude that LC Halpern is an exact optimal method. And the construction is as follow, as a following. And uh, um, yeah, for the case of gamma equals one, where we only consider the non-expansive operator, this quantity here is the lower bound to the uh, square norm of the square norm of the uh, fixed point residual, and this was the convergence rate of the OC Halpern with gamma equals one or OHM. Um, so the worst case operator looks like this, and you can see that, that if we start off from x, x equal to zero, then this term will have the the, the non-zero entries be expanding, starting from first entry being non-zero and others being zero to just second entry being also non-zero and, and so on and so on. And using those um, um, characteristics, we can prove that we can prove the lower bound, which is as the theorem states. Okay, so um, so this lower bound whole. This lower bound holds for the algorithm that generates a sequence of areas satisfying these assumptions, which we call uh, linear span assumptions. But um, there might be some very restrictive, um, there might be some other algorithm that is not taking the next iterate in from the linear span, which we have described here. Well, we can just, we can take the iterates from the old uh, from uh, to the extreme, from the orthogonal complement of the linear span, that we could that we just think of like really crazy, crazy um, methods. So we want to. So what we want to do is to not to restrict restrict the class of algorithm to satisfy this one. We want to consider a more more general class of algorithms that are not restricted to taking the iterate update from the linear span. So from now, from now on, we are going to consider a class of deterministic fixed point iterations, and they are of the form as this. So AK is it's a function that takes the takes a number of vectors and outputs the next iterate. So, but this AK does AK does not tell you how you use the information on y0 or the y0 minus t y0, y1 minus t y1, and so on. The thing that uh, we only know the fact that we are using the using these informations, but um, um, we don't know how they how we use it. And for these kind of fix, these kind of deterministic fixed point iterations, we use the technique called the resisting oracle technique to construct a worst case operator. So what we um, uh, to be more to be more um, uh, specific about the resisting oracle technique. Um, how um, so for the determinist, deterministic fixed point iteration that that the if we are given with the algorithm that we don't know how it uses the information, we will um, construct the worst case operator adaptively to that fixed point iteration. So the theorem statement is like this. If the underlying dimension to the contractor operator is bigger than or equal to 2n, and if we are given with any deterministic fixed point iteration and in any initial point, uh, we can construct a 1 over gamma contractive operator. But in the proof, you'll see that this 1 over gamma contractive operator and its pre precise form is unknown because we are just adaptively, adaptively choosing operator t that is dependent on the fixed uh, unknown. Um, variant of the deterministic fixed point iteration. Um, I'm not going to the details of the proof, but how the proof goes, uh, I just provide. I will just provide provide the outline. So we had we already have a lower bound with the algorithm with linear span assumption, and we'll 
And we will prove that this lower bound will also hold for something, some algorithm called the zero chain algorithm. So zero chain algorithm is the algorithm that is a bit like linear um, assumption, but they start from the zero and they are, um, these span will be um, changed into the, uh, the indices of the non-zero entry. So if the first entry, if, in, if the vectors in uh, vectors here are non-zero in the first entry and third entry, then we are going to choose yk to be some vector that is non-zero in the first entry and third entry, like, and goes on. And for, for these, and for, if we have proven the lower bound for the Jarrett chain algorithms, then we can apply the resisting oracle technique to um, when we are given with arbitrary deterministic fixed point iteration, we can construct the worst key operator that behaves almost the same as the algorithm with the linear span assumption. Therefore, the lower bound for the linear span assumption will hold, will also hold for deterministic fixed point iteration that does not necessarily have to satisfy the linear span assumption. Okay, so, so to summarize our contribution, we have shown that OC Halpern is the exact optimal deterministic fixed point iteration for non expansive operator and also for the contractive operator. And we have also shown that this is exactly alt optimal uh, by matching complexity lower, lower bound result. And these are some uh, very, very simple experiments. So first one is the experiment with uh, CT image reconstruction, which is solving the uh, solving the uh, least squares problem with L1 regularization term. And the middle one is approximating the arsenal burst distance and the right hand side, uh, the right um, plot for the experiment is about the decentralized, solving the decentralized optimization problem with the algorithm called the PG extra. And all these algorithms are uh, fixed point iteration. And if we consider those algorithm, algorithms as applying T iteratively, iteratively so, for the first one, we choose T to be the, the algorithm that is used for image, construct, image reconstruction. For the second one, for second one, the T is chosen as the uh, iterate update for approximating the EMD. And the right-hand side, this is the T cho chosen to be the PG extra operator. And if we, uh, for the plane exploitation, which is the black line, Will result in for the first one the polynomial conversions or for the second and third one somewhat close to um or for the second it is somewhat close to exponential rate because this is a log log plot could you share some details of the restarted or the happen versus uh yeah so the so the black light is the plain fixed point iteration and the blue blue line state uh, blue light is the plot for OHM or the OC Halpern with gamma equals one. Yeah. So can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so what is theta <laughs> tilde n? I mean, I don't think you defined it properly. Sorry, but I missed the. The actual term that I did I didn't define properly. What was it? Uh, that was theta theta tilde oh, yeah. n. Yeah, right. Um, so if I go back to the definition of the OGM and you see the AGM here, right? There is a set theta k here. And um, if you look into um, this is actually very similar to k over k plus three. And um, there is actually the recursive scheme that um, updates it, theta k plus one from the theta, the second order poly polynomial of theta k. And um, the theta k in AGM and the theta k in OGM are, are actually the same thing, except for the very last theta large n. So um, for AGM, it, it updates the theta, theta k uh, with uh, solving the second order polynomial. And OGM, we do the same thing, but only it differs at the very large, the last iterate. So for the OGM, you have, uh, actually you have to know the last iter the last iterate number to um, apply the method, if that helps. Okay, Did so basically in your, roughly speaking, your theta or theta tilde 
grows like you know something like n. So it's linear in n, you know, symptotically. Is that correct? Yes, true. That is correct. It is something okay. close to like k over two. Okay. All right. Thank, so, thank you. Uh, I, no problem. What kind of algorithm, uh, like optimization, would the right hand side upper bound would reduce to like the left hand side lower bound? Um, are, are there cases where this would be exactly the same? Would, would it? Uh, uh, that. The thing that I know of is only um, restricted to the smooth convex minimization problem, but in our paper, we did the same thing for the fixed point duration that have the matching, exactly matching. Exactly matching, okay. But usually people just, um, as the table suggests, or there are a lot of problems that we can solve, but, but usually people are very satisfied with the optimal method up to the constant factor or up to just so mm -hmm. shaving up the logarithm. Yes. So for the complex minimization problem we have been discussing, um, it, we can choose a different optimality measures and different initial conditions. But uh, so far we have been discussing on the function, the difference of the function value. And we have um, shown that the OGM is the exact optimal method and mm -hmm. AGM is an optimal method. But if we, if we uh, investigate on the optimality measure with the square gradient norm, then um, combining two methods result in whatever n to the power of four conversions. But we don't know um, what the exact optimal mm -hmm. method is. And this is, uh, this is the same for the smooth convex concave minimization, uh, minimized problem or smooth and non-convex optimization. And are there active research to find this uh, exact optimal methods in the field? Um, I didn't really uh, discuss uh, about how people actually find the exact optimal methods, but there is something, some um, computer assisted methodology called the performance estimation problem or PEP. So they are solving the, uh, they are formulating the, 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 the problem of finding the convergence rate to the algorithm into some kind of um, optimization problem we can solve numerically. So um, observing the numerical solution to those problems we can, find the conversion rate and also find the method if, uh, if we get the solution. And usually exact optimal methods are found using those kind of tools. I see. Yeah. Not uh, through analytics. Yeah, I, and I think that is the hardest <laughs> part we have to do right now. Are there other optimality measures other than fixed point residual? Um, what I saw in the literature are usually the fixed point residual or the distance to the fixed point. So xk minus x star. Uh, okay. Usually those two are, I think the, the most commonly used um, optimality measures for the fixed point iterations. But um, we are doing the optimality analysis on the fixed point mm -hmm. residual here. So when you are doing the average operator, I mean, are you fixing theta throughout your iteration, or are you allowed to change theta dependent on k? Uh, you can do both things. So here, I just wanted to show you the very, show you the simplest, um, the rate we can get, and this is actually the choosing lambda equal to one over two gives you the smallest upper bound that we can prove. That's why I brought this choice of lambda. But you okay, can choose I mean, lambda. Yes. Sorry, if you go one slide back, then you're making a claim that when you have the, you know, the average t converges to, you know, a fixed point. But I mean, I think there should be some qualifier here. I mean, I don't think, you know, you can actually do this with arbitrary theta sequence. I'm pretty sure you actually need to use a constant theta here um, for, for this claim. Actually, there is a condition something like um, lambda k be the difference of lambda k being summable. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, some, some something, something yeah, like, I, something I, like I, that. I, there are something, some conditions like that, but I wanted, I just wanted to show you how they, this is the, yeah, you're right. The average t here is the fixed, like, the average, um, uh, average coefficient theta being the constant. Yeah, you're right. And one more question is, I mean, that 
argument also implies that every contractive operators will have a fixed point. So, that is true. I mean, okay, but I mean, how about this? You know, when you rotate, okay, but you are rotating with you know small bit of you know norm contraction. Okay, so but you know the norm contraction becomes you know smaller and smaller. And in fact, you know, I actually would like to make it really you know summable, you know, even square summable. Okay, then. I believe that after some point, you know, you may actually, you know, slow down in the contraction of the norm itself, but you are still rotating around. And I think technically it is still a contractive mapping, but it is not, you know, one of our, you know, gamma contractive because, you know, you, you can be arbitrarily close to, to one norm, the norm of norm, you know, one, as, you know, your operator, you know, evolves, but still, you know, you are gonna have something that is strictly contractive. So not you know not just you know touching on the you know non-expensive side, but it is strictly contractive. So how do you handle that kind of scenario? So you were talking about a contraction with respect to the one norm here. If I uh, understood it. Yes. So I basically want to rotate, but I would like to reduce the norm very tiny bit. Okay, but that tiny bit will ultimately converge to, to one. Oh, okay, so um, I should have been uh, clarifying this before I start the talk, but we are considering the setup of the Hilbert space. So um, I'm using the RN here for the sake of simplicity, but this analysis can be up only applied to the Hilbert space with the inner product and the norm with norm which is induced by the inner product. So I think the L1, L1 norm doesn't apply for this kind of this paper, but there is actually a uh, work that has, has been recently published in, um, I think it was in mathematical programming that um, shows you that shows that the same kind of analysis can be done for the North spaces. That gives you, if that was the answer. Uh, you were okay. that, that, that was not my, you know, I mean, question, but anyway, I mean, you know, let's take it offline. I mean, so basically you are saying that every contractive mapping will actually converge into a unique fix, fixed point. So, so that yes. is a claim here. Yes. Okay. All right. So I, I guess that is Brewer's theorem or something, but I just wanted to double check. Okay. I mean, you started off your talk by, you know, just focusing on fixed point iterations. Okay. But yes. when you reach the point with Halpern and and we'll see Halpern. I don't think you are really, you know, staying within the, the scope of fixed point iteration because, you know, typically you are really doing the Markov evolution, you know, going from XK to XK plus one under the same operator over and over again. But when you go to OC upfront, actually you have a very long range dependence on the initial point. So that means that it feels like you are not really talking about the, I mean, the initial fixed point iteration, but it's a bigger space, you know. I mean, obviously, you know, I understand that that is needed for fast conversions, but you are kind of actually getting out of the scope of the problem to, <laughs> to get something faster. I mean, at least that is my impression. So do you have any comment on that? Um, yeah, so the, I think the very big difference is that for the plane fixed point iteration, you can just use the same thing over and over again. Therefore, in practice, you can just use the same function over and over, which will just reduce the com reduce the computational like um, uh, the computational like resources or stuff. So, um, but um, I think uh, for as I mentioned earlier, the uh, fixed point iteration with the average t will converge to the fixed point and. I, met, I also mentioned this is the example of the, the Kronos' command iteration. And um, so yes, in practice, the fixed point iteration with the, the fixed operator T would be much simpler, but what we wanted to do, uh, but um, the fixed point iteration with average operator is also very common in the convex optimization literature. So if I go back to, This table here. Um, so I so actually the gradient descent or the, the the first three examples are actually the average operators. So 
Yeah, I'm not worried about the average operator here. I'm just worried about using the initial point, you know, throughout because it's really, you know, not in the category of average operator anymore. You actually have a long range dependence on X zero explicitly. And, and, you know, essentially, you know, you are basically taking the convex combination of, well, I mean, maybe not convex, but yes, convex combination of the, whatever you're getting out of the operator plus the initial point. And that was, a, you know, the big distinction I wanted to draw your attention to. Yes, and I think that is also the big, um, distinction. But uh, um, well, I also wanted to tell that um, in order to get the, the faster conversions, the fixed point rate, plain fixed point iteration would be suboptimal. And um, <clears throat> yes, in practice, I think the, the plain fixed point iteration would be in, yeah, much, um, much better in practicality and stuff. But, I, but this, I just wanted uh, people in practice to uh, just um, consider this as um, another option, if that's possible. Yeah. Um, but but uh, in some it's... sense, you know, what you're doing is very counterintuitive because you know, ultimately what you really want to do is you'd like to reduce the normal, you know, X N to X star, right? So that you are really getting closer and closer to X star. So, Obviously, you know, you are closer to, I mean, at some point, large end, you know, where you are should be much, much closer than before where you started. So X then should be closer to X star than X zero. But still, you are dragging your, you know, iteration with X zero. So to me, it is extremely counterintuitive because I'd rather use, say, XK instead of X zero in my iteration. Okay, but what you're saying is you still would like to keep X0 in place of XK. So, I mean, how would you explain this? I mean, is it some just, you know, just mathematical, you know, I don't know. I mean, how do how, how you say, I mean, idiosyncrasy or do you think there is something fundamental going on? Um, well, the help iteration act is actually, it does converge to the solution and it has some additional characteristic that it will converge to the fixed point that is closest to the initial point. So if there are some people who are interested in finding the solutions that is the closest to the initial point, then maybe hop iteration are the, one of the great options for them. But for other reasons, I think you're right. Yeah, you may want to choose the XK and I understand that. <laughs> But so, if there is a unique fixed point, then I mean, you know, the the meaning of the closest, you know, the fixed point to X zero is moot. So because it, it's unique. So I mean, you know, for the same operator here, for example, you know, for this iteration, instead of you know doing the convex combination of you know the T X K and X zero, I mean, I could have done T X K and X K itself. Okay, and to me, that is more natural and more intuitive way of solving the problem. But still, you know, the claim here is you'd like to keep X zero in the, the equation. And, and that is a part I'm trying to kind of get my intuition, you know, follow because, you know, simply this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> and and you, you, you know why this, this is the case, right? I mean, because XK is supposed to be closer to X star than X zero. So how, how would you explain this intuitively? Um... Well, intu intuitively, I think um, if we use xk instead of x zero, we don't know where the trajectory trajectory will converge. If this is if there is a unique um, solution, then it is fine. But um, what we are considering here is a non-expansive operator, which is quite ge quite general. And for and also for the average operators, we there might be some multiple fixed point multiple fixed points. So. Um, so if we draw um, x0 to be somewhat, uh, the draw, draw the iter xk to be close to x0. Um, uh, so probably the question would be asked in a different way. So from the previous slide to this slide, so carbon method was introduced, right? Yes. And the, why did you 
choose hardware method? Is it because it is the kind of state of the art or is it to kind of prove this uh, kind of rollout and approval? Um, it was, um, I wasn't really choosing to find the helper to use help iteration to be the, the candidate for the optimal method. Mm. Um, but it had, but we had a like glimpse of thoughts on what would be the what would be the optimal method because actually the well this help iteration isn't the one uh, uh, isn't the one found using the computer but as I mentioned earlier there was some methodological path and the if we formulate uh, if we just reformulate problem into some other problem and find the equivalent uh, method that method is was found by path so we have some kind of hints that it would be um, exactly optimal in other types or other class of problems. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I started off with um, choosing Hallprint because in the other setup, it was, um, it was conjectured to be optimal. Do any of the, you don't know the mathematical aspect anymore. Uh, but from a higher level, like machine learning algorithms perspective, so this sort of techniques, how, 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 what are the implications of these sort of techniques for the higher level algorithms? So um, I think for if you if you mathematically, um, I don't want to say the word restrict, but if you restrict the class of algorithm you're considering, then I want to what I wanted to say is that um, you can. Um, differentiate between the optimal method and suboptimal method in theory. Because if you get the lower bound, then we um, then we get to know what is the optimal method go up to constant or whatever and distinguish them from suboptimal method that is like order like converges orders behind or whatever like that. So um, uh, I wanted to ask a similar question. For example, uh, can somebody develop a kind of better uh, gradient descent optimizer based on uh, your finding? I'm not sure. <laughs> Say that you're just using the existing Adam or whatever, but probably somebody can make kind of a better uh, gradient boost, gradient descent kind of a optimization method and implement that. So what you mean by gradient descent is that you're only choosing the step size for and yes, so the, there are kind of a, in practice, there are uh, many different kind of uh, approaches for optimizing this uh, gradient descent, especially in the Europe, neural net. And the probably based on this kind of approach, uh, somebody may kind of a help uh, kind of optimizer mm -hmm. instead of a um, widely used data optimizer. Yeah. I think that's, um, there are some words on um, something like, so, so I haven't mentioned in detail, but this algorithm was actually the the one the work. This work was done prior to our work, mm -hmm. but this is also based on using the initial point as well. Yeah. But it is solving the minimum problems. Problem. Sorry, can you? <laughs> can you say the question again? No, no, it was just echo. Yeah. 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 yeah, that sort of context, like if how can these sort of techniques be useful in improving, uh, you know, pick, pick any of the, say, one of the deep learning algorithms or architectures, like how, how can such techniques improve? The convergence of those are learning faster in a way of learning with fewer examples. So I, I don't know if I'm even asking the right question here, but like how, how do and these techniques impact the higher level algorithms? That's kind of my um, more of an application driven question. Um, I'm I don't know really the details of how <laughs> to training those all and so on, but if if we are able to find out if the algorithm that is that has been formulated into the iteration and that operator t is if it is very close to being non-expensive but not contraction, then maybe using Halpern gives you better convergence, better convergence, or 
I don't know about the generalizations, but maybe as well. And, and I also want to ask you about the question whether the um, well, fixed progressive, the alpha iteration is the algorithm that is um, that shows the optimal rate for the fixed point residual. And this would be, uh, if we use T to be like, like simple gradient design, it was just, it is just the, the norm of the gradient. And I want to know if the norm of the loss function or stuff is, how is it related to the actual convergence rate, actual convergence for the general, generalization? If we are able to find out the relation between them, maybe then we can use the help her Next step, but I'm not sure. Yeah, you can just you know, from a practical machine learning problems, the high level questions we ask is, can we learn the concepts, the, the I guess the underlying concept with fewer examples or um, a faster computation, right? Like one of these questions, can we do it with, you know, instead of 10,000 examples, can we do it with 20 examples, right? Exaggerating or like, you know, how, given the same set of examples, can we do it fast? So that's kind of the, like how, you know, I, I'm trying to map like that high level thing to low level uh, optimizations. Uh, yeah, I just want to see if you have any insights into how, how these techniques impact that. Um. So if, if we were able to choose T, like the T to be, well, first of all, close to non expensive operator and, um, if we are able to, let's say we have cho chosen the loss function and drawn the operator T from reformulating the problem, and if that if that graded the loss function represents some the uh, the priorities you want to you want to consider something like the like good generalization and stuff.